Welcome back to Raj Gets Real, the baseball edition. We have unscripted conversations about everything baseball. Our goal here is to help educate and share everything we know about the game of baseball. And here's your host, Roger Gonzalez. What's going on, guys? We're here with Kramer Robinson, an LSU legend. What's going on, man? How you been? I'm good, man. Just been grinding through spring training. Uh, finally wrapped it up today and looking forward to another good season. That's awesome, dude. Uh, do you already know where you're going? Yeah, I'm uh, heading to Memphis, Tennessee, uh, AAA. Uh, we got a bus at 3 a.m. to catch a 6 a.m. flight, so it's going to be an early morning, but it's all part of the grind. It is, man. I mean, uh, damn, 3 a.m., so that's early. You're used to that travel life, huh? I mean, you are. You Sometimes you'll bust through the night and then have a game that same day, so, you know, it's part of the process. Everybody has to go through it. It's not easy, and it never gets any easier, especially for me, I, I like my sleep and I like to sleep in. So uh, those bus rides in these early mornings are tough. But, you know, like I said, everybody has to go through it. So let's talk a little bit about the LSU journey for you, man. Um, you know, I know we were talking a little bit earlier about how your journey wasn't that easy. Um, kind of share a little bit about how it went for you. Yeah, so I came in like any highly touted freshman. You know, I thought I was all that. I thought I was on cloud nine that, you know, I was a lot better than I was. And I got to LSU and I was humbled quickly. Uh, I was behind All-American, big league all-star Alex Bregman at shortstop, which was my natural position. So I moved over to second base for the first time in my career. Um, I was exposed. I realized I wasn't as good as I thought I was. Um, worked really hard, you know, the whole time that I was there my freshman year, but never really got that breakthrough that year. Um, I went to the Cape Cod League that summer, had a great summer, uh, came back ready. I came back ready for my sophomore year. I was supposed to be the starting second baseman. I had a good fall and then went into the season and things weren't going the way I wanted when I had an elbow injury. Um, came back right in time when the team was going to Omaha and Coach Maneri made a very difficult decision not to take me to Omaha with him and it, it crushed me at the time. Uh, you know, I had to make a decision whether I wanted to come back to LSU and after, you know, really failing for two years. Uh, and I, I don't think you see a lot of kids that are 19, 20 years old after failing over and over and over and over again, you know, come back and be like, I, I can do this. You know, I, I'm built for this. I'm, I'm good enough to play here. I'm good enough to not only play here, but I can make an impact here. I always knew uh, in my heart that I could, even though, you know, whether it was the fans, the media, Maybe even my own teammates and coaches, I don't know if they believed in me or not. Um, but I believed in myself and I wanted to prove to everybody that I could do it. So instead of hitting, you know, transferring and going to another school, uh, I stuck it out and, you know, felt like I had a lot to prove that year, my junior year. And it uh, ended up being a great success. I was uh, first team all SEC, second team all American my junior year and really started to make a name for myself at LSU. Felt like I was a leader, a great teammate, and I learned a lot about myself those first two years because you'll learn the most about yourself when, when you fail. You know, everybody's happy. Everybody can be a good teammate when things are going well. But you learn a lot about a teammate or you learn a lot about yourself when you see them after a bad game or after a bad season. You see what kind of person they are, what kind of teammate they are. And I learned a lot about myself those two years. And I don't think I would still be sitting here playing baseball if I didn't learn from those first two years in school, uh, because when you get to professional baseball, it's and it's a grind and you fail a lot and nobody's going to get you out of it except for yourself. You, know, you don't have mom and dad here. You don't have a break in the middle of the week like in college. You're playing every day and you're playing against the best guys in the world. So without those experiences, my first couple of years in college, I, I really don't think I'd still be in, I would still be playing baseball. As you kind of telling your story there, Let's dive a little bit deeper. Why didn't you transfer out? I don't know if it was pride. I don't know if it was I knew I was good enough, but things weren't working out yet. But it, I just went with my instinct. You know, I'm not somebody who quits. You know, it's easy to quit. It's easy to go find another place where you're going to be given a starting job right away. It's just not who I am as a player and as a person to just give up on something when I dedicate my life to something, dedicate baseball to the university in the state of Louisiana. That's what I wanted. And that's what I told myself I was going to do. So it's, it's easy to give up, but 
why I didn't do it. Just not, I just don't believe in quitting. That's what, that's how I was raised. That's how I've been my whole life. I'll play the, this game until somebody doesn't give me a jersey. I, I just don't quit. Um, that's, that's just who I am as a person. That shows a lot about kind of the way you were raised and, and who you are. And, and specifically, do you think that um, staying at LSU has really has impacted? Like, if you think you would have transferred, do you think you'd be at where you're at right now? Do you think LSU helped you get to where you're at? Yeah, for, I mean, for so many reasons. If I transfer and I go somewhere else, and even if I have success immediately there, you don't learn those lessons. It's just, okay, well, this didn't work out. Just on to the next one. Like, you don't learn from that failure like you have to in pro ball. Um, like I said, that's just how how I was raised as, as a player and staying at LSU and having the opportunity to play for Coach Maneri, a Hall of Fame national championship coach who was so hard on me. Like people don't understand. You see this guy with this funny laugh and funny voice and smile and always happy. That guy was so hard on me. Not only my first day of college, my freshman year, he was hard on me all the way until my last two All-American seasons. He treated me the same way until I was out of there. So having the opportunity to play for Coach Maneri for four years. I'm extremely blessed. Nobody has had more of an impact on my baseball career than Paul Maneri has, and I will go take that to the grave. That guy made me into the player that I am today, and I hated him for two years. I couldn't stand him, didn't want to go to the field, but he was doing it because he saw potential in me, and I didn't realize it at the time. That's why he was pushing these certain buttons. Uh, I couldn't be the infielder I am. I couldn't have the mindset that I have uh, in professional baseball today without the guidance of Coach Maneri. He has had such an impact. I mean, you look across the big leagues and so many players that have played for Coach have had that impact. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful that I stayed to learn those lessons, and I'm also grateful that I stayed to play for Coach Maneri. And now Coach and I, you, we couldn't have a closer relationship uh, so I'm just really grateful for you know, every up and down peak and valley that I had at LSU at the time. That's awesome, man. If you could look at the camera and we could kind of, if we had a time machine, we can go back and we can put you in the conversation um, right after coach told you that, hey, you're not going to Omaha this year. What would you go back and tell yourself? Because I'm sure you were dealing with a bunch of demons right there. Yeah, as, as, low, as it, low as I ever was in a baseball career. Um, Trust your instinct. Believe in yourself. Uh, you've you've always known that you're good enough, and just keep going. You know you're going to learn from these failures, and you're going to get to where you want to be. Everything's going to work out. That's awesome. And and I'd like to ask one more question: If there if there's a kid out there right now who's thinking about transferring, who's at their dream school right now, you know, their whole life has been thinking about this opportunity. They got there season ends, whatever the case may be, what would you tell them? I would, I would tell them to not stop believing in, in themselves. Trust, trust your instinct. Don't quit. It's easy to quit. You know, if, if you're not good enough and you don't think you're good enough, it's okay to transfer. But if you know you can do it, don't let anybody else tell you you can't. It's, it's so easy, especially with the transfer portal now, to just go – and find another school. This has no. This place has an opening. This place has an opening. I'm going to go there. I mean, whatever happened from waiting your turn, learning from somebody who's better than you, like an Alex Bregman, and developing. There's nothing wrong with that. You, everybody's path is different, but we're not all going to be three-time All-Americans and then get drafted in the first round. It's okay to take a different path, and it's okay to learn from people that are better than you. That's how you get better. Mm -hmm. But to quit and to take the easy route, I'll, I'll, I'll never stand for it. I'll never believe in that. That's awesome. And I, and I love the fact that you keep talking about how Breggy made you better mm -hmm. and kind of, kind of share a little bit about how, how that competitive nature and how kind of going against each other like that. I'm sure it's built an amazing relationship as well. Alex and I have an outstanding relationship today. Um, but just like Coach Mary, Alex wasn't exactly the friendliest at, at all times. He was the veteran I was the cocky freshman that came in. I probably pissed him off multiple times, probably wanted nothing to do with me. Um, you know, but he, he still helped me. He still gave me the advice. At the same time, he wasn't 
always friendly. He wasn't always nice. And I didn't appreciate it at the time. It pissed me off. Like, okay, why, why can't it be a little, a little more friendly, a little more cordial on the field? But, like, he was hard on me. He was like a coach on the field. So, again, those are things you look back on now that you're a grown man, but you're looking at yourself as an 18-year-old boy. Um, I didn't like it at the time, but I appreciate him now. Uh, now that we're both grown, we're both doing our professional career, we have a great relationship. He called me this offseason to go – work out with him, um, we'll text, call each other. If I need anything, he's right there. It's a phone call away. So I'm thankful, Alex. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for Coach Maneri for being so hard on me, even when I wasn't ready for it. It, it paid off for me in the long run. I think that those lessons um, I'll, I'll hold on to, and I'm grateful, grateful for for life. A hundred percent, man. And a lot of times you're, you're, you've been talking about your belief, the fact that you can believe in yourself and the fact that you just, you knew you were good. Yep. Um, how much do you think your mom had to do with that? Well, yeah, I mean, when you live with a Hall of Fame coach uh, for your whole life, uh, that confidence does rub off on you. So like I said, I was a cocky little 18 year old kid that came into college thinking that I was going to be the best player the second I stepped on the field. And I love that looking back, like I'm proud of that because I still hold that. I still have that same, same mindset. It's bottled up now and it's more controlled, but I still have that mindset when I get on the field. I don't care if it's in a triple A game or if I'm in a major league game like I was today. Um, I truly feel, and I know it sounds crazy, but I always feel like I'm the best player on the field. I don't care who else is on the field. I really don't. Um, now I got that confidence from my mom and watching her. And she always told me that that's how I'm going to have to be. If I'm going to be successful, I'm not going to be six, four. I'm going to not going to be the biggest guy on the field. I never feel undersized in my mind, but she taught me that confidence as did coach Mary. When I got there, he's like, I love your confidence. I want you to be cocky on the field Now learn how to contain it. But I still carry that with me. And I still walk with my chest out when I'm on the field. Like I deserve to be here. I think that's important for, any player, uh, any position, any size, you should never walk on the field and feel overmatched and be in awe of anybody else on the field. You always need to believe in your abilities and what got you there because, yeah, you might be playing against the best in the world, but you're here for a reason as well. A hundred percent. And like you said, you know, your mom's been doing some pretty crazy things. Why, um, can you look at the camera and kind of say some words to her and just kind of, what would you tell her right now if you could be with her? I love you, mom. I'm so proud of you. Uh, I wish I could be there to celebrate everything with you. I know I'll see you soon at my games. Always your number one fan. You know this. Uh, and I'm so happy you're doing it for the state of Louisiana and my alma mater, LSU. I love you. That's awesome, man. And if you can kind of being able to, to be raised by a woman like that, mm -hmm. such a powerful woman, um, what are two or three things that just really stand out to you that she taught you that has completely changed your career. I don't know if there's anything that kind of come to mind. I know it's, it's a tougher question. Yeah. So the first thing that she taught me was confidence and was to act like you belong there. Um, the second thing is she's just real. Like, and I think she, any of her players or any of her, um, any of her coachings, any, any of her coaches would tell you the same thing. Anybody, any recruits house that she walks into, She's just real. She's going to tell you how she feels. She's not going to sugarcoat anything. She never has with me or anybody that's in, in her corner or on her team. Whether you want to hear it or not, she's going to tell you the truth. And you have to appreciate that. So I think that uh, when I'm in my baseball career, I want managers, I want coaches that just tell me the truth. Don't tell me a good job. Don't tell me like, hey, we, we like what you're doing. Maybe no, Just tell me straight up. You're not good enough. You're good enough. This is what you need to do. Cause that's how she was growing up. Um, and I think the third thing is she, you know, she loved me. Like it was tough love. It wasn't, if I had a good game, it wasn't come here and give, Oh, you did such a great job. I'm going to take you for ice cream after a little league game. You did so good. Um, it was okay. That's expected. Now handle yourself the same way as if you were over five, you come in the same, you'd be the same teammate when you're over five as you are when you're five for five. Don't get too high. Don't get too low. Uh, that's, that's what she, she always taught me from, I mean, T-ball. I can, I can remember her telling me to be even kill and to be a good teammate. Um, she just, 
she's special. She's different. Um, she's a once in a generation type of person. I can tell you that. And I, I know that I'm lucky to be her son and, and learn so many valuable life lessons from her. Um, and that, and you see why she's successful on the court and why she, in her first year, she's the national coach of the year at LSU. No, absolutely. And you've been talking a little, a lot about confidence and how she helped you. Let's kind of dive a little bit into that. If you're, you know, I don't think you have kids, but if you were to have kids or anything like that, what do you think you can implement? How can you, how can you actually teach that confidence? How does she do it for you? Let's break it down a little bit. Well, she, she would talk to me obviously about hard work. And I think hard work breeds confidence. It's hard to be confident when you don't put the work in with something. So if I go take hundreds and hundreds and thousands of ground balls and I'm prepared for the game, that's where the confidence comes from. Um, I think that, you know, it's rare for somebody to have, and she used to, she used to use this with me growing up, to have the it factor. You don't know what it is. You don't know, you can't explain it, but like that guy has it. Hmm. He might not be the biggest. He might not be the fastest, strongest, whatever. But like you want that guy up to bat in the big moments. You want the ball hit to him in the big moments. But I think for me, confidence comes down, from, comes down to preparation. Like if I'm prepared, I'm confident. Uh, if I go through my routine and I know that I've put the work in, I'm confident. But the other part of confidence is you either have it or you don't. Like you either believe in yourself or you don't. Like it's the fight or flight. Some people are going to fight and some people are, are going to run from it. And the big moments, when the big moments come, do you want to be the guy up to bat? Do you want to be the guy to take the last shot? Do you want to be the guy to catch the game-winning touchdown pass? Whatever it is, whatever sport it is, like you either do or you don't. And that's not something that can be taught. That's not any drill. You, you can't. You can be the biggest, fastest, strongest guy, but you know when the lights get real bright and it's it's nut, crunch, nut crunching time. Some people want it and some people don't. And you, sorry, you either have it or you don't. You can breed confidence by preparation, but to want to be in those moments and to not be afraid to fail, because I failed so many times. I'm not scared to fail anymore, you know? I'm like, okay, if I fail, I fail, but you know, you're gonna miss 100 of the shots, every shot that you don't take. So put me in the moment. I've, I'm successful now because of all of the failure I had at LSU and everything that's happened led up to my career at this point, all the disappointments. What's another at bat? You know, I want it. I want, I want that moment. 100%, man. I, I, I'm so glad that you're preaching this and you're talking about this. Today, I was talking to a fan outside and he was telling me about how his, his wife used to tell his kid that every single time he did bad, people were making fun of him. And I was just like, how can you tell your kid such a pessimistic thing? Like, yeah. this game's already so hard. Like, why so would hard. you? It's you got to be, be able and be willing to go out there and fail. Because if you're not, are you really pushing yourself? And yeah, my, my favorite quote, I couldn't, I couldn't say the whole thing, but is the man in the arena. If you look up the, the man in the arena quote, I think it was Theodore Roosevelt, I think. Um, it's great because you're not scared to fail. Everybody else is watching you. Well, I'm out here doing it. You're watching me, okay? I'm not scared to fail. I've been called everything in the book. I was playing in the big scale of college baseball the highest level of college baseball for the, the Yankees of college baseball and the college world series. There's nothing bigger than that until you get to the big leagues. Mm -hmm. And I failed. I lost the national championship. I made an error in one of the games. I, I have been called everything. I've seen everything. It's okay. I'm, I'm tougher You're now. Here. I'm here. I'm tougher now because of it. I think I'm more prepared for the big leagues because of that failure. The failure when I first got to LSU, the failure when I played high school football, losing a state championship. It's been like that my whole career. It's never been easy. In, in any sport, in any part of my career, it's never been a smooth ride. And minor league baseball definitely hasn't been. I've been disappointed year after year when I think I should be called up, when I think I should be here. It's just every path is different. But failure is so necessary for success. It's, it's absolutely necessary. Nobody that is successful will you talk to and they won't credit their failures for making them into whoever and whatever they are today.
A hundred percent, man. And as you keep talking about all the failures you've had, how have you been able to deal with that post failure? How have you been able to deal with that mentally? Is there anything that you do, anything that you suggest for people to kind of. I think it's only failure if you don't learn from it. I think that would be my, my biz, my biggest suggestion. Like you're not really failing if you learn from it. Like, cause now next time you're in that situation, you remember the last time you were the next time that big moment comes up, you're like, I'm prepared for this. So it's only, it's a matter of perspective, but yeah, you might not get the success you want in that moment, but it's, it's not really failure if you learn and you remember and you, have that mental note in your head. Absolutely, man. And let's let's kind of transition a little bit to educational baseball. You know, for mm-hmm. you, you've you've been at LSU. You're here with the Cardinals. You're you're in AAA now. What are what does a routine mean to you? I think any great player has a good routine. You see it with, I mean, the All Stars in the big leagues, and they all are very strict to their routines. Um, and it can be whatever you want, whatever how many swings you want, however many grounders you want. Everybody's different. But I think it's super important to get used to that at a young age. I wish I would have gotten more used to it at a young age. I was kind of hectic growing up. I was playing three different sports, so I was all I was all over the map. But I didn't really get a good routine until I got halfway through college maybe and then into pro ball. But it's very important to do what gets you into that good mindset and that com- comfortability. I said that right, comfortability. I think that's what's going to get you in the zone and get you confident and in the right mental space and the right physical space. So what does a, day, a day-to-day look like for you? Like how, how, do, how are you preparing yourself for a game day? A night game I'm sleeping in because I like to sleep. Um, I'm getting enough food in me so that I'm, that's not an issue during the game. And then when I get to the yard, um, I'm chill out for a little bit and I'll go into the – I'll go into the cage and I'll do my three rounds of flips. I do a heavy bat the first round and whatever drills that is for you. But for me, I go do my flips for three rounds. Um, then I'll go hang out for a little bit and usually go onto the field, take a few ground balls, which basically lead up right into batting practice. In batting practice, I try to say middle for the first, first few rounds. And then the last couple rounds, I let it eat a little bit. And I'm trying to turn on the ball 2 3 one and then go back to the game and maybe study the pitcher. It's, uh, we have pretty good uh, video and scouting reports now. So I'll study the pitcher and know all his tendencies. Uh, and then that leads basically up to my shower and put in some music for about the last 10 minutes as I'm getting ready and putting my uniform on and then it's go time. How much uh, how much thinking is going on during the game, during your at bats, stuff like that? I'm I'm making adjustments pitch to pitch, uh, and for me, I it's more of a feel thing, trusting my instinct and trusting the scouting report. But seeing how guys are pitching, the pitchers pitching other guys in the lineup, um, but I'm adjusting pitch to pitch. Like I'm not having, I could have the approach. I'm going up there like, all right, I'm looking to drive the ball to right center and stay back, and then. I see a pitch and I'm like, oh, never mind. I, I'm feeling good. I'm about to turn and burn or the opposite. So it, it all depends on the situation, place and time. But you got to be, if, I think really good players will tell you they adjust pitch to pitch. I love how you said that, but I want to take a quick step back on, you said pitch to pitch, but you said approach. When did you learn what an approach was? Too late in my career. Not too late because I'm still here. Um, college when guys were better than me and I couldn't just go up there and hit the ball. I had to have an idea of what I was doing because when I was in high school, you're just so much better than everybody you're playing. You know that. And in, in most anybody that's played pro and college ball can probably say that. Um, so I, I would just go up there in high school and just swing. I wouldn't have a scouting board, just go hit the ball. And then I got to college and I was getting my doors blown off by 95 and guys were throwing real sliders and curveballs and I was struggling I was like okay I better you know calm this down and have an idea of what I'm doing up there and then just through time I figured out what I was good at and try to do what you're good at don't try to be somebody you're not how'd you figure that out failure failure and realizing that okay I'm pretty good at hitting balls the other way I can hit the ball to right center pretty well if they make a mistake I can turn on it but I'm not a guy that goes up there and just trying to hit homer homers like I did in high school 
So I think through failure, those first couple of years, I realized, like, okay, what did I, through all that failure, what was I actually still doing well? And why did I do that well? Why didn't I stick to that? And then just build upon that. So I just try to do the things that I do well. Be really hard out. Um, if they make a mistake, I have the athletic ability and this power to hit home runs and doubles. But just sticking to what I do well, not trying to be somebody I'm not, and learning that through all the failure in college and, and pro ball. And it just, you know, now that I'm in AAA and one step from the big leagues, I have a, a lot better idea of who I am as a baseball player than I did 10 years ago. Absolutely. And that's, you know, kind of like we talked a little bit on, on earlier, it's the reason why I'm doing it is to be able to kind of help these guys out there. You know, the 14 year old Kramer who's out there, who, who's in high school and didn't really know what an approach was. Mm -hmm. What would you tell them right now? How, how would you kind of guide them? Well, I, I would ask them first, like, what do you do well? What do you think you do well? And whether that's like me at the time, hitting the ball the other way, I could consistently do that. Or whether that's hitting home runs or whether that's making contact, whatever it is, like I don't strike out, whatever it is. Okay, let's build up on that first. Figure out what you do best and let's start from there. So what's the next step after that? Growing it. You're, you, master, you master that. Um, and then you develop, like, okay, so what are your weaknesses? So I remember when I got to college, I, my backhand, I thought was kind of weak. So I, you just work it, just work your weaknesses. So make your weakness a, str a strength. Now I'm not saying like, okay, you don't hit home runs. Well, now don't all of a sudden just go try to start hitting a bunch of home runs. That's not what I'm saying. But if your weakness is the inside corner, let's start working on it. Well, how are we going to do that? And that's how you grow. But figure out which the first thing you do is just figure out what you do well. And then from that, your weaknesses that are fixable, that are that you can grow, that you can make strengths. Um, and once you do that, you're you're starting to become a pretty good baseball player if you can build from there. What about defensively? Let's talk a little bit about the defense for you. Okay. Um, what are some of the things that you've learned throughout this journey that is, you know, you would again going back to a 14-year-old kid, 13-year-old kid, you would tell them. If you're going to make an error, do it being aggressive. I don't, if a coach gets on you for making an error and you're coming and you're charging the ball and you're being aggressive or you're throwing it hard across the infield, then that coach is wrong. He's teaching you the wrong way. Because when I got to college, that was the first thing Maneri ever taught me. He's the best infield guy I've, I've ever worked with, hands down. Come get the ball, be aggressive. If, I will never get on you if you are being aggressive and charging the ball or making a good, solid throw to first base. That's where you start. Now, you, you can talk drills. Everybody has their own drills. Short pick, short, short hops, whatever it is. But the first thing I would teach an infielder is to be aggressive. Have that mindset of, I'm going to get the ball. Same with pop-ups, like, this ball is mine until you're called off by an outfielder. Like, want the ball hit to you. That was the thing that I had to... I've had to really make myself do, and that was a process over time, was every pitch being able to lock in, like, this ball's coming to me right now, and I'm ready for it. And when it does, I'm charging. I'm going my left, going my right, I'm charging. Um, that's the first thing. That's, that's the first most important thing is being aggressive. And then just practice. I mean, just repetition. How many balls, how many ground balls do you think somebody should actually be taking if they want to take this seriously? What does that really mean? Like work hard in the infield. What does that mean? I like to go not during the season because you can't overdo it during the season. You have to be mindful. I'm playing 150, 160 games this year. In the off season, I want to go until like my legs are weak. Like I'm really like, like I've been sprinting because when you're tired, that's when you form the muscle memory and you're really tired. Um, that's when you get your best work because you have to use your fundamentals when you're, when you're not tired, it's easy. You can just catch it, flip it over to first base, look smooth. But like when I'm gassed, like I have to do everything right. And I have to concentrate on the catch and the footwork and the throw. So in the offseason, I want to go until I'm like bending over, like really tired. And that's, again, that's a Maneri thing. Maneri used to work us, man. I used to be so miserable after taking ground balls, but it was something I still use in the offseason. Don't suggest that all the time during the season. Um, now, if you're a high school kid, you have off days. That's different. You're a college guy. You have 
four, three, four games a week, different. Um, yeah, when you're taking grounders, work on your drills, work on your footwork and your fundamentals, but I don't know if there's a certain number, everybody's different, everybody's in different shape, but go until you're gassed, at least sometimes, because that's when you got to really concentrate. I love the fact that you said that, and you keep talking about how hard you guys worked at LSU, because I feel like a lot of people just think that they just bring in these crazy talented players, and it's just like easy a walk in the park for them. But from, your, from what you're making it sound, it's no joke. You guys are grinding every single day, working your butts off. Let me tell you, it takes us. It took a special type of player to play at LSU for Coach Maneri. Talent was just one of the many things. He was going to break you, and he broke everybody. I don't care who you were. I don't care if you were Aaron Nola, Alex Bregman, DJ LeMay. You go down the list to Kramer Robertson to anybody. He broke everybody and was the and was hard on everybody. So you had to be a dog, and you had to be mentally there. And you had to be physically there and you had to be quick on your feet, like I said, mentally and physically, because he was going to test you in every way. That guy was calling on you in the office or in the team meetings, like, what's this? What's the end? I mean, your mind spinning. My freshman mind was like, I got class, I got study hall, I got weights, I got Coach Maneri, who's <laughs> worse than all of them. So, yeah, it, that's the talent was the baseline. That's not going to get you on the field at LSU. Everybody there was good. Everybody there was good. He it, was trying to weed you out. It, I just, I love that so much, man, because I just feel like as, as we keep moving on and as generations and society changes a little bit, they just think it just, it's just second nature. They just think it just happens. It's, it's not. You just work your butt off for it. My biggest problem with society today in baseball, society in general, is people feel so entitled you're a high school All-American, like I deserve to go play at LSU and be a college, a collegiate All-American and be the starting shortstop or wherever and whatever sport. Like, no, the hell you don't. Go earn, go earn that shit, bro. That you don't deserve anything. You get what you earn. Like, go out there and work. You want to be that good. I like you have big dreams, but like, there's a lot of other really good players out there that are gonna work harder than you if you don't. If you feel entitled, I was also that kid. Let me tell you, I went into college probably a little entitled. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm this great high school player. Like, I'm gonna come in and be this. And boy, was I humble quickly. So I think that's just my biggest issue is you think that you're just supposed to be given something and you're not going to earn it. If you can look at the camera and talk to a 12 year old kid out there, one message for them, what would it be? Believe in yourself. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't do something. Only you know that and you decide that. All that right, was bro. awesome, man. Cool. I really appreciate yeah. you doing this. Thank you so much, man. Honestly. For um, sure, bro. I think there's a lot, a lot for, for these guys to learn from this. I think that if it's, if it wasn't just the hard work, if it wasn't the confidence, if it wasn't the determination, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have the career you've had, have the memories you've had. Um, I'm really excited to see what, where, you, where you end up and what keeps going. I'm really excited to see what happens with you this year. And I'm sure it's only a matter of time, bud. Thank you, bro. I appreciate you having me. Awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode and learned something valuable from it. If you did, smash that like button as it helps us reach more people just like yourself. But before you go, please consider hitting that subscribe button and turning on the bell notification as my dedication to this YouTube channel and to this podcast is about to explode and I don't want you guys to miss any of it out. So hit that bell notification, turn that subscriber on, and I know I said it backwards, but who cares? You guys know what I mean.